Hi everyone and happy Friday. We are so excited that this weekend finally brings the 50th reunion of the AFAM Cultural Center. After several years of planning, they are finally back on campus and we are thrilled to have a Yale Alumni Live episode today with an incredible graduate from the School of Public Health. Catherine Finney is here to tell us her Yale story. So I'm gonna get her up here with me and we're gonna talk about her Yale experience. Hi, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Hello. We're so excited to have you here with us today as this has been like, we were talking to the planners of the house's 50th anniversary a couple weeks ago, and it's literally like 10 years in the making. So we are so excited to finally be celebrating this milestone and to share your story with everyone today. So we're going to get started the way we always do on Yale Alumni Live. We're a very casual environment. So we like to tell personal stories here. So we'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about you and your Yale story. How did you come to be a student at Yale? What brought you to Yale? So what brought me to Yale was I, um, as an undergraduate, I went to Rutgers University and I went abroad for a year and I got sick. I actually got malaria and it had such an impact on my life. Um, because I was an American, I had the best health care you could possibly have. But, you know, there were other people who were in the hospital with me who weren't American, who didn't have the sort of resources that I have, who didn't get the same level of care. And that just had such an impact on me. So when I came back, I knew that I wanted to go into public health. And so I looked at the top public health schools and applied um, and, and got into you know, Johns Hopkins and Harvard and Yale, but it's I went to Yale to visit. Um, and it was something about the campus. And also, this is going to sound crazy, and I think anyone who is a person of color or who comes from a family of immigrants will relate to this. They, I brought my mother and my grandmother with me, not <laughs> because they needed to look at the school, but they happened to be visiting that week. And so when we went into the School of Public Health building, they were so gracious and so nice to my mom and my grandma um, that I just felt like home. Um, and I know that sounds really crazy. And when you're in graduate school, that's that's usually not the big factor. But it, it felt like home. It felt like a place that I could start and build my career. Um, and that has turned out to be quite true. I love that. Well, we do like to be as welcoming as possible to everyone, grandparents, aunts, uncles, the whole nine. So when you were at Rutgers, what were you studying? Were you always kind of thinking about public health or was that like illness really a change for you in direction? Yeah, I, I thought I was going to go to law school and be like the first black woman president. That's what I thought I was going to do. Um, but getting sick had a big impact on uh where I saw myself going. Also, before I went to Ghana, I had happened to uh, be an intern, both at the White House and also with Senator Paul Wellstone. And it was during the time period of which there was a, a debate about um, actually welfare reform. And it just being there during that debate and seeing people uh, basically vote against things that didn't even match their own morals, it, it was really problematic for me. Um, and the discussion about people, human beings, who maybe didn't have the same resources or access or who didn't have the same uh, political clout, but they were talked about as others, it just had such a negative impact on me that I was like, I don't wanna go into politics. <laughs> it was just, I care too much about people and human beings. Um, to be able to talk about people in this sort of abstract way. And so all that led up to me going to Ghana and then I get sick within about two months of being um, in the country. And it was just like public health. Like this is really where I think I could have the most impact. Right. And so you mentioned that your mother and your grandmother came to visit Yale with you. And I understand. So obviously I was watching some interviews of you and listening to your mm -hmm. podcast, which has amazing <laughs> intro music, by the way. So I need to talk to someone at Yale about getting me some cool yeah. intro music. Uh, but I understand yes. that your grandparents, <laughs> right? So good. <laughs> um, your grandparents. Bubbles. 
Um, I want to give a shout out to Tamara Bubbles. That is the artist that does yeah. the intro song. She's an amazing artist, self-produced, um, and just a really amazing yeah. artist. And, and I'd like to give a shout out to her and thank her for letting us use um, her, her brilliant music. Yeah, it's so awesome. I love it. We got I have to upgrade this show eventually. But you you mentioned your grandmother and your mother. And I heard you say um, in several of your interviews that your grandparents were highly influential in your life. Will you tell me a little bit about that and the role that they played and how they've shaped your your life so far? So I grew up spending a lot of time with my grandmother. Um, I'm actually named at her, after her. Her name is Catherine um, as well. And a funny side story, I didn't know my grandmother's name was Catherine until I was like 12 because we call her Dooney. And so I would like write letters to like Dooney and not to Catherine because I didn't know, like she was always Dooney to me. And so um, I'm named after her and she was an entrepreneur. She was a seamstress. She um, sewed clothing and had fashion shows in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I grew up around that. My sense of style, my sense of fashion comes from her. My appreciation of design. Um, I love art as well as fashion. And that all that came from her. And I grew up spending time with her in her sewing room. Um, so I know how to sew and do patterns and things like that. I got to see her interact in business. I saw her, you know, how she kept her books. At that time, you kept it in a notebook because we didn't have, you know, QuickBooks and stuff like that. But I saw her do that. I saw her negotiate um, with, with others. And it had a big impact on me from a business standpoint. And in my book, Build a Damn Thing, I talk a lot about her and growing up and seeing that. This, you know, Black businesswoman in the 1980s, in the 1990s, Midwest, America and how that had a big impact on on how I do business and how I think about business. Yeah, they're so special. So when she was with you at Yale, did she get a good sense from the community at Yale as well? Did she give us like the seal of approval? Well, I think my family is so used to me being in very interesting places at that point, <laughs> even though I was 22, that I think what they appreciated was the sense of Go where you're wanted. And that was something that my parents had always shared with me. Like, go where you're wanted. And it was obvious to my family that Yale wanted me. Mm -hmm. um, and the other schools wanted me too. But, but Yale really wanted me. And it was go where you're wanted, go where you're appreciated. And I think just in general in life, that's really good advice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for my grandmother, it's like Yale wants you. This is an opportunity for you to go where you're wanted. It's not that the other schools aren't great. And not that they don't want you, but this school really wants you and it feels like home for you. So invest and stay here. I love that. So tell us a little bit about your experience at Yale, maybe some of your favorite memories or, or experiences that you could let us in on. You know, the thing that I didn't know, and this is going to sound like I'm, I'm sorry to all my professors who may be <laughs> watching this, but I, I actually partied a lot, which is like crazy. <laughs> Yeah, graduate yes, school. Love that. Thing, when I went to Yale, I did not think I was gonna like have as much fun as I did. Like I literally did not think, and I ended up having the time of my life and creating and building lifelong friends. And so um my friends joked that I was like the queen of gypsies. Um <laughs> like the graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, you're the queen of gypsy. Um, and spent a lot of time at the AFAM house, particularly yeah. doing Yale Harvard. Yep. So I have a lot of memories of spending time at AFAM during Yale Harvard and um, the parties there. And so um, I just had like such a good time. I lived at York and Crown, those like sort of townhouse sort of situations. So I had this amazingly fabulous apartment um, and I had like decked it out so much that the uh, yellow housing actually took pictures of it and used it for a while on the website for housing. Um, I was like, no 22 year old graduate student should have like a place that like tricked out. But, um, and I used to spend a lot of time. So I would ride my bike to campus quite a bit. And so I, I spent a lot of time like riding around um, campus. I spent a lot of time, I remember um, the School of Medicine has their big talent show. And so I remember doing like a bunch of stuff for the talent show. Um, friends of mine who are now uh, uh, really prominent 
physicians, but back then we were just like graduate students. I mean, we would do these dances. We had this big elaborate dance that involved like 15 people um, <laughs> that that we did uh, for the talent show. It was just like crazy stuff. And now as an adult, um, I'm like, how did I have time to do all of that? Like, and graduate with, with honors, right? Like, how did I do that? I mean, the time management skills were like pretty impressive um, <laughs> that we had. But I had such a good time and created lifelong friends and, and lifelong mentors. Um, Dr. Tigner, who was just has been a mentor my entire life, who's just been an amazing force. Um, and you know, it just was such a positive experience. Um, I remember biostats, which I thought I was not going to make it through, but um, I think Dr. Elizabeth Bradley taught it. And she was like a neurosurgeon, a marathon runner. She did something else and like also taught biostats to everyone. I mean, it was just like, how do you, like, how do you, you do like the most. And it was the, one of the best classes I ever took um, and so well taught and explained biostats in a way that, um, was so accessible to people, right? Um, who would have thunk, like, you know, like the <laughs> bio stats could be fun, but she made it fun and she made it relevant. And so I had this like amazing, amazing time that I didn't think I would actually have, if I'm being really honest. Yeah. Um, I didn't think that that would be, you know, graduate school for me. Yeah. I, that's incredible. I just have to say for the record, like you're the gypsy queen. That's kind of amazing, right? Like you need a t-shirt that says that or something. What a title to be done. A lot about it on my podcast about being at Yale. And in fact, on it's the second episode, two of my friends, two of my like friends from my time at Yale um, were interviewed too. And the, and the thing they talk about is like, yeah, we were talking about how to use Yale resources to improve community and the HIV AIDS work that we did in New Haven. But they're like, also, Catherine found the party too. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, she did all this amazing thing and she's brilliant, but like, don't get it twisted. Catherine like found the party. <laughs> I love that. I think that is a very, very good way to be very serious in your work. Play hard, party hard, play hard, that whole kind of thing going yeah. on. So so tell us a little bit about uh, your transition from life out of Yale and the party yeah. at the gym to what you started to do professionally and take us through the changes that have occurred in your yeah. career through the last several years. When I left Yale, I actually had a fellowship with USAID and I was working back in West Africa. I had lived in West Africa before and I came back working with USAID, USAID and Planned Parenthood, the International Planned Parenthood. I um, mean, I was there, it was supposed to be a two year assignment and then my father got ill, he got very seriously ill and I had to come home. And anyone who's ever had that call where they tell you, you gotta come home, it's like the worst call ever, but it was like, we need you to get on the next plane and come home right away. And so I came home and and I obviously couldn't go back. Um, it, that was during a time where you didn't have Zooms and stuff like that. It was the early 2000s. And so I came back and didn't know exactly what I was going to do. Um, but then I got a position uh, with an international epidemiological organization based in Philly and moved to Philly. And I, and I got married. <laughs> I moved to Philly, got married. And just found myself, and my father passed away, and found myself kind of like um, trying to rethink how I was going to live. I was traveling a lot internationally, and it was you know, difficult to do that while you're married. I wasn't traveling to easy places to get to. It was Shremel Shrake, the Sinai Peninsula, and to, you know, Jaipur in India. I mean, it wasn't like I was going to, like, you know, Chicago. <laughs> right, right, it was like right, long right. places. Um, and so I came back, and was kind of like figuring out what I was going to do next. My father had passed away. It was just a lot happening. And I started a small blog. Um, I took a, a local job running a nonprofit called Black Women's Health Project and started this blog on the side. And this blog became a thing. And I did an interview with Associated Press. Uh, it went everywhere. At the time, the Associated Press provided content for pretty much every online magazine at that point because people didn't invest in online content. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, what was this little hobby became a business. 
And then I got a book deal from Random House, one of the first bloggers to get one. And it just was off. And so here I was, this epidemiologist that was kind of thrown in this world. My blog was all about fashion on a budget. And so um, it became a thing. And so I didn't actually see it as a business until I got the book deal. Um, and then I was like, word, like people were interested in this other than my mom. Like, wow, someone wants <laughs> to read this other than like, you know, my friends. Um, and the book came out and it was really successful. And so it became a business. Um, I was a correspondent for the Today Show, uh, did a lot of stuff. I talk about this like quite extensively um, yeah. in my book because it was like, how do you how do you start something? How do you build it? Um, and so, yeah, it was just pretty amazing. And then from there, I decided to sell the company. I had an experience at a incubator in which... Um, at that time, there were very few women in tech, but very few mm -hmm. Black women. And it was the first time in my life where people had really no expectations of me, not just low expectations, but no. And, you know, here I am, this Yale train, graduating top of my class, you know, bomb person. And people literally did not think I can do the work based on my gender and my race. And it was mm -hmm. just incredible for me. And so... I took that, I ended up selling my company, which is great. Um, and I went to go work for another woman-led startup, which also got bought. So it was part of two exits pretty quickly. And then started a organization to help other Black women who are in startups called Digital Undivided. Um, and led that and was the CEO of that for eight years until the pandemic. And I had planned on transitioning from the organization anyway, but the pandemic yeah. delayed it a little bit. Um, and so, but while there, I saw the power of capital. I learned the power of capital um, that I started a project called the Dooney Fund, named after my grandma, who I talked about. Um, yeah. It was during the pandemic. There was a lot of women, particularly Black women and Black people who couldn't get the PPP loans. If we remember, and if anyone's a business owner, it's very difficult to get a PPP loan unless you had a private banker. I happened to have had a private banker. And so I was able to do that for an organization. But a lot of Black founders didn't. And so as a result, I started uh, this like fund that was um, for people like women of color. I took mm -hmm. uh, money that I had left over from a, a vacation and um, we started the Dooney Fund. We started off by giving out a uh, hundred, uh, one hundred dollar uh, grants, and then within a six week time period, we end up giving out one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of grants um, to over fifteen hundred Black women led entrepreneurs. It was the most incredible thing I ever did in my life. This past year in twenty twenty one, we end up giving out fifty thousand as well. So it was pretty amazing. That is amazing. Now, I heard you talk on your podcast about uh, really building a friendship bracelet business and cornering the market yeah. and babysitting. And I heard something about you being very, very smart about, I think, um, loaning your brother some money. Is that right? Does that, is that true? To the yeah. Story? <laughs> it's really because you know my brother talks about it in the in her podcast yeah. about how I would loan him money at very competitive interest rates. Yeah. Um, even at age nine, he, he would tell you. Everyone in my family is like, I, I always knew how to make money. I always had money, and so yeah. I had this friendship bracelet business that was very successful in fourth grade. And my brother was one of my primary sales um, staff. He's actually interesting enough. He leads a sales department for Zoom now. <laughs> So I often joked and gave him his first sales job. And so, um, you know, he really owes it to me that he's like a successful sales exec. But um, but he was like, you know, he would sell at, he was, you know, a, a, a big basketball player in high school. So he would help sell within the high school market for me. I had the elementary school market. I had a friend that was in junior high. So I cornered all the different markets. And I was clearing, you know, $50, $60 a week you know, at age nine, um, I would get discounts from Kmart. If those of us who remember Kmart, they used oh, to yeah. have the embroidery thread. And they would give me like the staff discount. Um, and so I would, I would do that. 
And um, it was pretty, pretty amazing. And so um, I remember one time with my parents, we went out to dinner and it was a nice dinner. And I think the total bill was like $40 or something like that. And, you know, and I was like, I got this. And my parents were like, you're 10. How, how are you? <laughs> They're like, we don't, we're confused. Like, where are you getting money to like, be like, I got the bill. Like at 10 years old, don't worry about it. Um, it's on me, like, <laughs> you know. But yeah, I used to loan my brother money quite a bit. And there was also another time where he owed me like, you know, $10 and he was really mad at me because I was like, you know, I want my money with interest. Um, again, I was like, you know, a very tough, like nine, 10 year old. And, you know, we had to do family court. Um, and my parents were like, you owe her the money. And so my brother went to the bank and got like, I don't know if it was like a thousand pennies or something. <laughs> and, and he got this big bag of like, when I say it was like this big, massive, like bag of a thousand pennies. And he was like, here's your money. Oh my <laughs> like, God. And I my parents that. were like, it's legal tender. You have to like, and so he taught me very early um, contract law at, at nine and making sure that in the contract, because I would make him sign contracts even at nine. Um, <laughs> I, f I found one and I was like, I need to like stipulate how I want to get paid. And I learned that like at age, you know, nine or 10 to make sure that I want to get paid in, you know, cash bills. And I think I put like, I want to put, put like bills and like underscored it. Like, like <laughs> not in pennies. <laughs> oh my God. I love these stories. These are the best stories. Thank you so much for sharing these with me. That's so funny. The reason why I brought that up is because I was going to say, you know, as a, as a little girl who is making friendship bracelets and has is building this business, would you have ever, you know, seen yourself doing what you are now? And maybe as, you know, maybe as the epidemiology student, yeah. this might be a major departure, but with those stories you just shared, this makes perfect sense. I mean, this, it all comes together. You know, it's not even a departure, you know, now that I'm a, a venture capitalist and I talk mm -hmm. a little bit about this in the, in the book, build a damn thing. Yeah. You know, I I had a full circle moment in September yeah. where I invested in a company called Health and Her Hue that's led by a black woman MPH. Um, yeah. And it's sort of WebMD for black women. And I am wow. one of the, the lead investors in that company. So it is not actually a departure from epidemiologists. Yeah. I'm literally a black woman epidemiologist turned investor investing in other black women entrepreneurs entrepreneurs who happen to be epidemiologists as well. And so it's a very much a full circle moment and the line yeah. is definitely connected. That also happens wow. to be one of our most successful investments too. Yeah. Um, and so where I invest as a VC is really in health and healthy communities. And so yeah. I use my Yale MPH education regularly on a daily basis from learning and looking at trends and trend forecasting to even frankly, just understanding the markets that my founders are in or looking at companies and assessing, you know, the possible impact that can have on health indicators. So I use it all the time. Um, yeah. Made me an amazing investor. That's thank you. Thank you for connecting those dots. It's really incredible and really inspiring and special. And I know we only have a few minutes left together. So I want to talk just for a few minutes about build the damn thing, the podcast, the book, and then just, if you would share with us, we started to talk a little bit about the house and this being a very celebration, a uh, very significant celebration for the house right now. And you know, if if you had to draw upon some some memories and some experiences at the house, and what would you say to young black women who are sitting, you know, at the house right now, who are students at Yale, who are, are getting the experience of meeting all these alums on this special occasion? Like, you know, how does that? What does that look like for you? What does that feel like for you? For this this big celebration and and the future, looking forward to the future. I am so honored to have been able to spend time at the house. I am so honored to have been able to be a part of such a legacy of, of this excellence, of Black yeah. excellence. It is, yeah. it is an honor for me. Um, it is an honor for me to even be considered in the same breath as some of the other distinguished alumni. Um, and I my advice would be to really take a moment 
and and absorb the moment we're in. I think we're in a, a time period where everything's moving so fast that rarely yeah. we take a, a, a we don't really take time to stop and appreciate the moment that we're in. And so I would say to students who are watching, like, take a moment and appreciate the moment that we're in. The your your fellow students, the alumni that you're around, like really seize the moment and be in the moment. Um, and I know it's really hard because we all want to be on the TikToks and the grams and stuff like that. <laughs> but really taking a moment to be present in this in this excellence that we have the privilege to be in, um, I think that is the biggest advice I would would give. Uh, for me, again, it's been such an honor to be associated with this legacy, and I do not uh, take it lightly to be asked to to speak. Um, by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm so honored and I'm so excited for the next generation. I am so excited about how they're viewing the future, how um, you all are just not carrying the same sort of stuff that we have, <laughs> you know, yeah. how you're reaching the world and really pushing forward and pushing old people like me forward, which I love, um, and, and, and sort of helping us to think differently. And that's one of the things I talk about in the book. And my hope yeah. with Build the Damn Thing is that it really kind of lays out the lessons that I've learned. There are things that I wish I knew. Um, but when I started to build my business, there weren't there weren't Catherine Finney's to, to look yeah. up to. There were no black women. When I started my blog in 2002, and I know many people were born after that. Yeah, I don't talk about that though. That's a very uncomfortable <laughs> fact. <laughs> I am old. I am 46 years old and I'm so proud of that because so many people haven't made it to 46. I wear that as an honor. Like yeah. I don't look at that as being bad at all. I think that's amazing. Um, but I say that to say when I started my blog, there were no women bloggers, let alone black women bloggers. So I didn't have mentorship and there was a lot of stuff I had to learn the hard way. And right. so my hope with Build the Damn Thing was I put everything that I learned. So hopefully this next generation doesn't have to make the same mistakes I made. Make new mistakes. Don't make the mistakes I <laughs> made, right? Yeah. And so that's why I really wrote the book is all the different things that you need to know in order to build a business, all the advice that you need, all of that. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for it. And I'm excited to, to hear um, feedback. We've already gotten some pretty early great feedback from it. So, yeah. Yeah. We're so excited to have you on this show, but to be a member of the Yale community. And I understand that you are also doing something later in May with the Yale Club of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make sure that everybody knows how to access that. We have regional clubs across the globe. So we are really grateful that you're willing to take the time to talk even more in depth about Build a Damn Thing, the podcast, the book. We'll make sure everybody knows how to get that, get their hands on that and learn more from you. Catherine, it's been such a pleasure getting to know you and hearing your story. And for those of you watching, we're actually headed over to the, well, I am headed over to the house in a little bit to do some live coverage um, and give you some behind the scenes look uh, looks at what's going on at the house today and tomorrow. So we'll be live on at Yale alumni on Instagram. And Catherine, it's just such a pleasure. Thank you so much Thank for being so a part much. of that really rich history of the house and for spending some time with us today. So May 26th webinar through the Yale Club of Silicon Valley. Check out more from Catherine, Build the Damn Thing. Coolest, coolest story I've gotten in a long time. Thank you so much, Catherine. It was such a pleasure. Thank you all See you all soon. Fun, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Catherine.